Welcome to Speaking to Civil Society. In Civil Society magazine in the past 16 years, our conversations have mostly been with people who espouse ideas and drive trends. Our Bala Subramanian is one such change maker. He's a physician by training and he's worked in villages for, for decades, but he also knows a thing or two about companies. He knows a thing or two about raising funds for good ideas. He's here to talk about a social stock exchange. The idea itself comes from the finance minister's speech in parliament last year. But what exactly is a social stock exchange? What are social enterprises? How will good ideas be funded in such an arrangement? Mr. Balasubramaniam has looked at the working of social stock exchanges across the world. He's done a detailed report. We're here to talk to him about what we can expect and how this arrangement is going to work. Mr. Balasubramaniam, you have done a very detailed report on the feasibility of creating a social stock exchange in India. Now, the stock exchange as we know it is a place where people buy and sell and trade and profit. Uh, it's a place for bulls and bears. What exactly is a social stock exchange? You know, before I get into the stock exchange proper, let's look at why do people invest in business? People invest in business looking for returns. And that's a normative understanding of why anybody would be interested in business. And when they list their company on a stock exchange, the intent is they're going to source public resources from the general public and then try to build their company and in return for, the, uh, for which the investor would get a dividend. And these companies to ensure that they are regulated, that there is a transparency involved, the declarations made by the company are actually validated by a regulatory body. That's how the very concept of a stock exchange came in. And now a social stock exchange would not be very different from this. It plays a similar role. The role is to get entities listed, get the investment instruments validated. It could be a debenture, it could be an equity instrument, it could be a debt instrument, different kinds of financial instruments, get them validated. You know, transparently uh, have the companies disclose, are they making any profits? and where the investor also, his interests are protected. So essentially it is protecting the interests of several people involved in this game. A social stock exchange, the essential difference would be that these companies don't exist for the profits of any individual person. Now, over time, stock exchanges started evolving along with the evolution of little difference in thinking of companies. Companies started coming under pressure to ensure that their, the harm that they may be causing to the planet can be mitigated or minimized. And so a lot of investors started looking at companies which are not just making profits, but also asking these questions of how good is your environmental obligation? How good is your social obligation? How good is your governance in your company in terms of disclosures, transparency, etc.? And therefore companies moved towards what is now traditionally known as the ESG thinking. And in the world of business, they called it the triple bottom line. We're looking at people, planets and profits. So investors evolved and said, I'm going to be concerned about these things. Based on all this understanding, the United Nations came up with this concept called, can we think of a social stock exchange initiative where we mandate the disclosure of all this and look at returns in terms of social gains. So what emerged as private gains started moving towards social gains and different companies have attempted this. So this is essentially going to be a social enterprise whose primary purpose of existence is going to be creating social good. And just creating social good is not going to be enough now because you need to also ensure that the people who are investing in the social good get some fair returns. Doesn't have to be market returns because the investor is looking for returns. It's not absorbing. So, so, so we'll come to that. We, you know, we, we will come to that. But, but a couple of questions just on the structure sure. of, a social, of a social stock exchange. Are you saying that if, on a social stock exchange, people would be able to buy and sell shares and trade them in just like any stock exchange? You know, in ideal understanding of the social stock exchange, that is the mandate. But let me also give a caveat here. There are close to 14 social stock exchanges that have been set up around the world in several countries in different stages of evolution. Not a single stock exchange can be truly called fully functional and successful. 
Now the ideal is when you are able to trade, list trade and then declare dividends and then say, let's say you invest on uh, the Vivekananda Youth Movement and then I give you shares and I promise a certain amount of dividends and tomorrow I deliver on the promise and somebody else is interested in buying those shares from you. And if they can do it, that's a real functional stock exchange. Mm -hmm. Only in Canada right now, the Canadian Social Stock Exchange has got reasonable amount of trading that is being allowed. Most of the other stock exchanges have not really fully evolved into it. So if you look at my report, I've actually classified five of them to be trying to be on the trajectory of reaching a level of a social stock exchange. Six of them are mostly equivalents of a stock exchange. They're all in different stages of evolution. Many of them are essentially just portals, matchmaking portals and nothing more than that. Okay. You can't call them a stock exchange in a real sense. Okay. But, but you know, the idea of getting into this, into this stock exchange format is to sort of free up money, to bring in money for causes which might not normally be getting the money that they need. Is that correct? I mean, this is, is, is to be able to attract, attract investment in causes which are uh, crying out for uh, funds and support. Uh, see, the, the world of social sector development is always starved of funds. But let me give, put things in perspective. India is a signatory of the UN SDGs. Now, the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals that we have set for ourselves as, as a world and as a member country in extension India, by 2030, we're expected to reach them. Now, if you look at the reality of the situation, if to reach those SDGs in whatever sense, it will take us a trillion dollar expenditure per year on the social sector. There is no trillion dollars available to invest on that kind of expenditures. Right now, the current expenditures all the public sector expenditure, government, multinational agencies, civil society organizations, all put together in India, working towards the SDG attainment, is only around $440 billion, mm -hmm. which means there's a huge deficit of $560 billion mm -hmm. that you can, just cannot generate. The governments are going bankrupt. And, and, governments and, and, focus and on... You need, that, you need that money to come from, from private sources, basically. Because private sources have money, and can we get that money for getting them to do good? I'm saying this in the context of looking at the way, uh, you know, NGOs traditionally depend on philanthropy, the other extreme of corporate sector depending on resources for profit making, a huge band. But the world is now slowly moving towards socially responsible investing. Then they talked about impact investing. They started looking at so very zero good. returns. Very good. But, yeah. you know, how, how do you attract money? How do you attract money in a, in a stock exchange? You know, in, yeah. In a stock exchange or in a market, you attract money. You know, markets run on bubbles. Markets run on excitement. Right? You know, money moves when, when people feel get very interested. Right? Now, uh, the, typical, uh, the typical market would find people investing in a company because there's a bubble around either the segment, the sector, or, you know, the, particularly, the particular entrepreneur and what that guy is trying to do. Now, when you try to translate all this to the to the social sector or you go to entities which are entirely driven with let's say trying to deliver a social uh, good uh, how would this play out you know uh, the, the way it's, the exchange has been currently being described or the way the working group report of the so sebi which has come out recently I, I don't think they're fundamentally not taking into consideration uh, what you're trying to raise right now, there, I think there are three components. When we talk of social stock exchange, we're talking of it as though it's one single homogeneous entity. I don't see it that way. I think the stock exchange is only a small little regulatory bit. But to make it functional, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I, I would put them in three buckets. I would call one bucket the supply side. Why would I as an investor want to invest in an entity where I'm not going to be seeing returns or I'm going to be seeing very low returns or lower than market returns? So there has to be a reasonable amount of incentive for me to even think of all that. And then there's a central theme, which is what everybody seems to be focusing on, or SEBI is focusing on, is the actual stock exchange, that, that where they also have a lot of intermediaries. You need to people to assess a company's worth. You need people to understand the, the impact being produced. Somebody has to make those disclosures, those measurable disclosures, to convince the investor that these things are actually working, to bring in those transparency guidelines, etc. And there's a third bucket called the demand side. And that is what I would like to spend a little time talking about. Where, though having been for nearly four decades on the demand side of the business, I know we social sector organizations only work with social commitments. We have never thought of profit. In our DNA, it doesn't exist. Okay. It just so, doesn't exist. So, so what, you're, what you're looking at here is 
is a structure which can be clearly identified and within that structure you feel it will be, it will be more feasible to provide funds for purposes. Is, is this fundamentally what you're doing? Yeah. Uh, what, I'm, uh, what I'm trying to say is to even reach a stage where an investor would have reasonable investor confidence in an in organization to even deliver social returns, the delivering organizations, the demand side which can absorb this money, their capacity is to first absorb money, their capacity is to look at impact and produce impact, and their capacity is to generate even if the social dividend, it may not be a financial dividend alone. That is, doesn't exist today. You need to work on creating the ecosystem first before you can even launch a social stock exchange. So, That's so, the part but, so an, an NGO stroke company, stroke uh, limited liability company, whatever, uh, partnership, whatever, right, gets greater credibility if it's working within the framework of a stock exchange, right? Uh, yes. Where there are certain regulations which allow it to be upfront and transparent about many of its processes, right? Uh, if that is so, then uh, a social enterprise is in quite clearly a hybrid between it's an enterprise and it's also a social initiative. Right? Now, uh, have you explored, you know, how something like this would be valued? You know, let's say a social enterprise comes in with comes to a stock market, a social stock exchange with an IPO. Uh, how would you value? Uh, a social enterprise you know uh, i wouldn't before you even get into valuing it how would you even define a social enterprise because we we, we use this word so uh, casually nowadays that we don't even understand that entity called a social enterprise is is, is still a entity which has not been described under law in india so these are just self, self you know i can simply say i'm a social enterprise what do i mean by that i know a lot of companies would start off saying i'm a social enterprise but in a scratch below the surface, they're registered as formal for-profit companies. Now, a social enterprise is a functional entity right now in India. What I mean by that is I'm just saying I'm an enterprise, but I'm producing social good. But honestly, every company can say they're producing social good. Every for-profit entity can say I'm producing social good. Let's say a car manufacturer. He can say I'm actually enabling for transportation of people. I'm moving people from point A to point B, which is social good. So we cannot justify that. You can't go just by a functional understanding of a social enterprise. There has to be a legally mandated understanding where different countries are defined it differently. Like I myself have brought it in my report, 62 different definitions currently in use around the world. The closest I would recommend is either the definition used by the British or we generate an Indian social enterprise definition where we look at profits that an entity generates and plows it back into the social good it is doing without declaring dividends for any individual investor. That could be one extreme understanding of social enterprise. May not be practical very much because people may not invest if I'm not going to see returns for myself. So what we are saying is the promoters don't get any returns, but an investor might actually get less than market returns and he gets, he gets to see social good. Now here it comes, it's a dicey situation. No NGO, every NGO says we are doing good. I've been in the NGO sector for, like I said, four decades. I will never come out and say I may not be doing good. We all declare that we're doing good. But what is good? How do we measure good? These are very uncomfortable questions, which we in the sector themselves are not asked. So yes. one is to measure a social obligation. One is to measure it in a way in which it can translate as a monetizable commodity for an investor to understand, is it actually generating good the way I want it to happen? Yes. That is the journey we NGOs have to take first. And so I would say define the social enterprise and my nervousness is, SEBI right now in its working group report no, so, so has what, deliberately what, refused. I, are you saying it is a challenge to value social enterprises? A challenge to value social enterprise if you have not defined what is social, what is enterprise, put it together and make a legally mandatable obligation of that particular entity. For example, as a non-profit, let me tell you the, just give an example for that. As an NGO today, I run a hospital, I run schools, we charge fees, we charge patients money. Our returns are pathetic. Like, you know, if I spend 100 rupees, I get back 40 rupees mm -hmm. from all the expenditure. So 60 rupees is still donor dependent. I have no choice. Mm -hmm. But I'm allowed to raise 40 rupee revenues because they're health and education activities. The law permits it. But I run a training institution. I run a research program. In those organizations, the law is very clear. I cannot generate more than 25% of my total revenues as user income. Now, the, India's definitions are so very suffocating in terms of tax laws that yeah. the moment I have more than 20, if I generate the 26th rupee, 
I'll have to be shut down as a not-for-profit entity. Now you say I have to become a social enterprise, give dividends. How would I do it if the legal framework doesn't permit it? So you so need we have a, a lot of work to do. You you need you you need a new and and universally acceptable definition of what a social enterprise is. Legally valid and lot of policy changes and taxation law changes. All of it have to go first before you talk of a stock exchange. See, my concern was when the finance minister announced the setting up of a stock exchange. I think a little more homework needed to be done in what is the social ecosystem that has to exist first before the system is ready to absorb a stock exchange. If, My if, worry is, if, yeah. if, even if you if you today had a definition of a social enterprise, uh, whether you do or you don't, the the yeah. question of valuation still remains. You know, even if tomorrow okay. you do, if, if even if tomorrow you do have a clear definition of social enterprise, which says you can use hundred percent of your user charges for your cause. Uh, the question of valuation would still remain. Uh, how 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 would you value something which is social and enterprise together, right? Which would take predominance, right? And uh, how would an investor be enticed or 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 made interested in a company like this on what particular basis? See, uh, valuation principles exist around the world. Whether it is the there's the impact investment council which is brought about how do you measure impact how do you actually monetize it how do you look for the investors perspective there's that gain uh, network which also looks at all these things those things have actually been defined globally there's certain standards established but the, what we shouldn't forget the moment is a social enterprise is the primacy of the organization's existence is social so you are trying to not just balance the profit logic with the social logic but there's a primacy of the social logic. And that valuation is very critical when you're valuing it. So we need a new way of thinking for valuers. We new we new breed of assessors mm -hmm. who are competent in understanding how to measure social impact. Now, what SEBI or any of these professional for-profit stock exchanges have today are market valuers who are actually used to the inter enterprise part of the system. Now, either they need to be trained or retrained, or we need to have a new brand of assessors, valuers. The standards are very clear who are trained in these and then actually deploy them to measure before they come into an IPO. So okay. those tools exist. Okay. okay. So, so you, 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 you need a whole bunch of uh, people and skill sets to be able to do this. And, Absolutely. And, and also you need an audience which is going to appreciate those skill sets and, and, and the assumptions being made under those. Two questions here. One sure. is that a large number of businesses today are driven because of the social values they they put forth or they, that they use to define themselves. A lot of companies have begun as socially driven companies and ended up being hugely valued. Right? Uh, Body Shop was sold in billions and uh, there are many more examples. There are any number of larger companies today which are operating in multiple segments and, and, uh, and, and technologies which depend on, on generating community interest, generate, uh, uh, project their social values, so on and so forth. If you move from the IPO to the secondary market, right, where a company which has done a good job at being able to project itself in this way, acquires a value which is way beyond what was originally perceived when it was a social enterprise strictly within these, these definitions, what happens? What happens in a secondary market? What happens to this company, which has been hugely successful beyond uh, its own social goals and actually multiplied its commercial possibilities? You know, these are all, these are all questions which have to be uh, tested as we go along. Like I, I really don't have a spontaneous answer, but these are really troubling questions. And that is exactly the reason why we need to get this whole concept clear first in the first place. Right now, it is so gray and ambiguous that it opens itself up to all these challenges and the urgency with which we're going about setting up the exchange. My fear is they're only focusing on the investor logic. They're not focusing on everything that you're raising now. So if I'm going to only be uh, using and then uh, there's a danger I see actually as much as I am a votary of the social stock exchange for finding resources to do social good my fear and concern is it's being used as an instrument possibly to have two kinds of two or three kinds of impact which if it's not thought through can emerge the first impact is 
does it mean that the government is absolved of its social responsibility is a primary question that i would raise now just because i get private sector investment does it take away the mandate of any government exists for its citizens and its people and the social sector investments are going to is it going to further disappear or come down or be an excuse for the government to further reduce it the second difference the second challenge i have is the ecosystem is altering rapidly and we are promoting like if the proposed draft changes to the csr act is actually implemented by the government it virtually eliminates societies and trusts from the ambit of receiving csr grants and there is a huge effort to promote section 8 companies as a vehicle to be doing social develop social sector development now if the stock exchange is going to give define itself and frame itself to protect and promote the interests of only section 8 companies it could become a vehicle of just rechannelizing funds from a profit making entity to its own self but declared as a non profit entity yeah. it may not really reach the social sector space at all it may just be a way of transacting within your own ecosystems that's the second fear i have and the third fear is if there's investor pressure on the social sector enterprise to just generate dividends and profits so over time there'll be situations in which we may lose the very mandate for which we started out for and the currently the way it's being structured only large global ngos or global enterprises can become get the dna of the social organizations can get the dna of an enterprise and move into that space it will virtually kill or eliminate small and medium sector ngos so the exchange has to be so thought out that there is space for everybody now we cannot forget philanthropy in our country is a cherished cultural process small ngos or rural ngo will have no way of even understanding what a financial instrument is i struggle to understand it all my research with all my understanding we, we, let's let's come to that because you know that's a very important segment of you know the people who are to benefit can they benefit but before we get to that just a little more because an an effort here is being made to to give an established commercial structure to something which so far does not exist i tell you what was philanthropy so let's just go one stage further because we have seen the, the example of microfinance uh um, so uh you know you let's assume you have this uh, social enterprise it's a listed is listed on our social stock exchange right you have this um, five, one two three four and five investors and you have a board and you have a management now how how will you be rewarding the managers of this company you know uh, what will you be giving them will you be giving them start uh, sweat equity will you be giving them bonuses uh, will you be punishing them for being too profitable will you be rewarding them for being too profitable uh, uh, how how will you how will you tame their animal instincts having wetted them already with a structure which is called a uh, stock exchange and investors so um, uh, any thoughts on this i think again uh, uh, i'm just going back to your question uh, even when you question this you're already making a premise that the stock exchange is going to be set up and that's that's my fear that's exactly the fear in terms of the, the construct for india the background work for creating the ecosystem is a very very important first step it's a precursor step i believe we are 3 to 4 years from a stock exchange if you don't do that work if you do it and set up the stock exchange we're going to have all the dangers that you're talking about let me g- explain this further now thailand started creating a social enterprise ecosystem 10 to 12 years ago they started bringing in this slow shift in dna of thinking and encourage ngos to say you can't be better eternally dependent on philanthropy you need to find opportunities to generate your own revenues to sustain your own work so they created a space a shift in thinking a building of talent everything and only now they're talking about a social stock exchange but what do other countries do now uk in 2013 set up its social stock exchange but they said it will be part of the london stock exchange and there are only 11 or 12 companies actually which are listed there you can you the billet ask us why aren't everybody running for this because the regulatory measurements of performance of being there is so rigid that everybody can't simply jump in from here to there in india it's so weak they, they'll actually jump in that's what those are my fears what else did the uk government did they brought in a new law to create a new entity which is neither an ngo nor a true enterprise call a community interest company so it's called a cic and there they said how does it perform how does it behave what kind of an animal is it how does it uh, do to qualify itself to be listed what are the obligations and what is reasonable salary what is reasonable profit everything is defined and they also created a market opportunity and said all government contracts all government opportunities first priority would be given to cics 
Now, that is the UK way of thinking. Now, look at the American way of thinking. They also have a stock exchange for social sector, but it didn't simply emerge. There's a market Wait, pressure. Could you just repeat that? The American way? You, you, the, could you just repeat that? The, in the United States, there's also a, a, a similar process, but there it's market driven. What happened was a, actually a non-profit NGO started what is called the concept of B Corp, benefit corporation. They said corporations must exist for the benefit of society, not for making money. They defined the clauses. It was self-declaration of am I a benefit corporation. Very rigorous, very methodical. Then NGO would come do the due diligence assessment and give you a certificate of B, I'm a B Corp. Now, you're not a legally recognizable entity, but over the last 20, 30 years, state governments and state legislatures have actually passed laws recognizing the validity of a B Corp certificate. And that's a huge market evolution. Those B Corps, everything is listed. What kind of, like what you said, can you give a bonus? Can you give performance based on the amount of uh, business you do? All that is regulated. You have to declare it. It's measured and only then you're eligible to be listed and you get tax incentives for that. So there are various processes. There's also this uh, low profit limited companies, the three, uh, three LCs in the US. So they have created new structures, new vehicles, because you cannot simply shift an existing for profit entity. And that is my fear. The existing SEBI working group report simply builds instruments for a for profit entity to simply declare it's a social enterprise. There's a real danger of all that you're talking in that. My feeling is neither is the NGO fully ready with the existing laws. Instead of investing time on changing all the laws required for NGOs, why not we create a new legal entity since we don't have any called a social enterprise, take the best of the DNA from the CICs and the B Corps, put in all these regulatory processes, allow a new animal to arise, yeah. allow it to mature, evolve over three to four years and then get them listed in the stock exchange. Then that, that's the way to go forward. That's the ecosystem you need to prepare. Okay. Otherwise, all the dangers you're talking about is going to happen. Okay. Now, now in, you know, in all this thinking and you know, just going back to many of the words that you use, uh, we continue to look at a dichotomy between making money and doing good, right? So being socially relevant and making money. Now, this has been a ye old debate. And uh, uh, in our country, we have, uh, you know, Gandhi and trusteeship and so on and so forth. Uh, that they're not, it, it's not new to us, right? We've discussed it and so have a whole lot of other societies. Now, are we, it seems to me that at a time when Consumer expectations are that uh, companies need to be more like NGOs, right? in a sense that they need to be more socially caring and more doing more good than just making. We are we are sort of trying to reverse the process here because, actually speaking, what our expectations are from from the social enterprise are uh, should be the expectations from any corporation. Let me, um, uh, you know, what you're saying is absolutely true. We need to really be cognizant of what's happening in this entire ecosystem over the last three to four decades. So you, cannot, you cannot segmentize. For convenience purposes, we segmentize and say the government, which originated in the first place, the first, therefore we call it the first sector, has a public obligation. It takes taxation revenues and therefore obligates itself to provide goods and services. That's how the very concept of public sector emerged. And when they actually could not fulfill all the necessities for the people, the private sector emerged where the shift came from public good to private gains. Mm. And then we said these two are also not good enough. Government is also may not be delivering and everything. The private sector might be exploiting and maybe ruthless profiteering. So the civil society groups emerged and said, we will fill these gaps. Mm. So, and then we called ourselves the third sector. Mm. But look at what has happened in the last three decades. Across the world, governments are withdrawing from social obligations. Mm -hmm. They are looking at efficiency now. They're selling off things. Like I remember in, in my own small thing, when I was in the tribal areas working, there's a small Grameen bank there. The bank would never have made a profit. But the very fact that the bank existed enabled people like me to actually start the self-help group movement. Our tribal women could walk five or six kilometers to the bank, invest and come back. The bank never made a profit. For six years into this, when we created a massive microcredit process, the bank shut down. And when I went and met the chairman of the bank said, please don't shut it down. He said, no, the government has a new regulation which says we don't worry about the social obligation. You have to be making a profit. They actually shut down the bank. 
that that what, what the signal it sends out is governments are also looking at survival and profits so government has started moving towards the even if you look at a spectrum government in one end the private sector in one end the government is now inching towards the private sector it sells off its airports it sells off its airlines it sells off all these companies it created for public good the private sector let me complete the private sector then moves is also moving towards a social obligation i'll give a classical example Unilever and I was talking to the former chairman a few years ago when we were in a meeting at Cornell. He was talking about a simple experiment. He said the micro beads that they're putting into the fairness creams and all the moisturizers, they, we can't even see the micro plastic beads. But after we wash our face, no, no consumer or a client asks this question. We just use it, young people use it and then they wash their face, it goes into the drain. Finally, if you look at it, tons of micro beads are in our ocean. A set of young people in the US got together and said, this is unacceptable. You are polluting our oceans. Not only will we not use your cream, we will start uh, creating a counter marketing process where we'll destroy your credibility that you're destroying the ocean. Don't call yourself sustainable if you're using micro beads. So he had to use millions of dollars of investment in R&D, shift the narrative and say, I'll stop using micro beads. Now, the pressure of the consumer and pressure of some investors on Unilever shifted their thinking and they started making such product without the micro plastic micro beads into them. Now that is also a movement where companies are becoming socially conscious. They're looking at profits, but can they make it in better ways? Now, if you look at the NGO sector like ours, we were perpetually dependent on philanthropy. Yes, the shift I'm asking is we need to move towards the intersection of philanthropy and finance. We need to build our skills. If I need to continue to serve my tribal population, if I need to continue to serve the people I'm working with, the HIV AIDS or the tuberculosis patients and everybody that we're working for, we need sustained certainty of income. Like I cannot say six months later, where am I going to be? Because I don't know where the money is going to come from. This year alone, this as an example, 35% of CSR funding from all the corporates have gone into PMKs, hmm. which means I and, hmm. I and other small NGOs have lost their support from the CSR world. The uncertainties are increasing, but I can't stop telling people that don't, don't come to school tomorrow or don't worry about your, uh, don't take your tuberculosis medication tomorrow because I don't have funding. I'm obligated to complete the social good I've begun, which means I have to find ways of sustaining myself. So I'm moving towards sustainability. I'm telling people as you get out of poverty, as your ability to pay comes in, you start paying for my services too. I will not make a profit as a commitment I give. If my service has cost 10 rupees, I'll take 10 rupees from you. Till you reach 10 rupees, I'll create a safety mechanism where you can, you'll still get treatment, but you don't have to worry. So we are all moving towards what I call an emerging fourth sector. Mm -hmm. A fourth sector which has actually got the best of DNAs of all these three. The best DNA of public sector and public obligation, a social commitment that the NGOs can bring in and the efficiency commitment that the for-profit world can bring in. This is the only sustainable way of ensuring societal movement. This will ensure that we care about the planet, we'll care about people or profits. And I bring in the fourth P as an obligation, peace around the world. Equity can happen and we can ensure fairness, justice and all this. Everybody gets rewarded for the benefits they create. So can we move a new entity which focuses not profit maximization, but benefit optimization? And those are the companies that deserve to be listed in a stock exchange, deserve the support of the private sector, and they can deliver benefits to everybody. Okay. Now, now you know, the, all this is dependent on the fact that there are a whole lot of other people with the money who agree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure you would be too confident of that yourself. Uh, do, is there really a demand for such a system in, in the pure form in which you talk of it? You happen to mention that a lot of CSR money goes to PM Cares Fund. Now, the question is, why does it go there? It goes there because corporations want to carry favor with the PM. And, you know, there's no doubt about that. Right? Uh, let's call up spade a spade. So, what makes us think that there is a demand for for this kind of idea, which goes beyond the immediate goals of either an individual or a corporation, which may be narrowly limited to, uh, to, the, to the commercial gains that that corporation or that individual might be making, right? So it, it may seem that this is a larger social good, right? a larger thing happening in, in, in a social way, right? But at the end of the day, the kind of, the kind of thing that's in, envisaged in, in in terms of getting you to funding, which will make, help you think beyond your six months, you know, to a year or two years or three years in a much more structured manner. Uh, is there the demand? 
you know uh, there's now because this 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 narratives are being shifting the last 10 years there's a lot of academic interest in what's happening our company is moving our companies are promoting the esg concept are they really making more profits so there is now an increasing understanding that close to 14 to 15% of global gdp is actually coming from organizations which are making the subscriptions they are actually believing in this and living up to this they may be in all the three sides they could be in public sector in the private sector civil society organizations the 26% of employment comes from this set of people with this kind of ideals which is a moving shift because we were not measuring all this we were not defining all this we didn't even know all this today there is a growing body of evidence that substantial employment substantial gdps are getting emerging from the for for benefit thinking so we need to formalize it there's a global movement now i'm many of us are around the world are getting into this space i i am a very active participant in that we are all trying to shift the narrative i'll give a small example <coughs> the state of california state of california as a as a state is possibly the fifth or sixth or seventh largest economy in the world itself if california catches a cold whole of us will sneeze that's the size of their economy so the if the covid had not happened they were seriously exploring how does a state move towards a for benefit thinking Now, the laws that california brings in any sector whether it is same sex marriage or pollution control norms or the way they treat every other uh, ecosystem requirements they are the pioneers the trend setters now our hope is when governments like that start taking a call and start defining it extends we have worked on it we have defined policies we have actually said how can a ordinary company transition to be a for benefit company what are the mechanisms what are the tools what are the cost and what are the benefits you'll actually gain do you actually gain just profits or do you actually expand your business therefore more profits so there are clearly measurable instruments that are being made available today and we are promoting it what are the policy shifts that governments need to take what are the kind of capacities that civil society organizations need to build to transition into the space because end of the day what choice the society have we cannot have the mindless ruthless pursuit of consumerization and consumerist economies they'll destroy the world covid is a classical example of it we cannot have governments dominating development and creating their own monopolies which are actually inefficient and wasteful in india 85% of the funds rajiv gandhi in parliament declared that it is just transactional that's too much of a wastage civil society groups cannot keep talking about philanthropy and donations they are not going to happen every time and not hold themselves accountable to deliver an impact we have to produce results how long can i keep fighting poverty sometimes i ask myself this question 36 37 years of what i am doing why am i continuing to do all this till if people had got out of poverty i asked this question to certain big leaders of bangladesh also if you have been fighting poverty for 40 years what business are you still doing now you are still fighting poverty why aren't we all asking these difficult questions to ourselves so we need to find answers that are uncomfortable maybe but we need to transition and look at business can't be normal let's use the covid as an example as a milestone and say can we define a new normal for all of us in responding to the global situation i think opportunities lie here if we can really construct this very clearly define everything a lot of work has been done if we are all willing to look at it we are all willing to explore it i think here is an opportunity for a huge paradigm shift it can look frightening any change is frightening but let me ask a simple question let me look at myself as an individual right why talk about companies to change i as an individual we today very few people ask this question of ourselves do you know the maximum carbon footprint impact is not from the cars we drive or the planes we fly that's an excuse we keep giving but it's the clothes the cloth industry is the largest footprint in this world 35 to 36% of carbon footprint comes from the fashion industry we only need three sets of clothes to wear average human being in this world buys 9 to 12 sets of clothes if you ask yourself this question or myself this questions how many t-shirts i buy how many inner garments i buy how many pants i buy one jeans pant takes 8000 liters of water to produce now if i were to say i'll be a responsible consumer if i were to say i'll be a responsible investor i will not invest in a company and buy their shares if they are not following these rules so i as a consumer i as an investor i as a stakeholder start seeking benefits which will help me in this in this definition shift will start happening everywhere governments can ask these questions individuals need to ask this question so change has to be at three levels at the individual level at the institutional level and at the policy level institutional i would include both private sector institutions and civil society organizations it is long hard work it is not easy but then change is not easy anyway right but i am not looking at it pressing a button and change happen but, but would you agree like on several you know fundamental things which face us in our, in, our, in 
as an economy, as a society. You take just two, education, take healthcare. Uh, we've seen uh, people, we've seen the country go aggressively in the direction of privatization in terms of healthcare, and we, we found that it hasn't worked, right? Uh, it, it's, it leaves everything wanting and a pandemic shows it up for what it is. Uh, we've faced the same experiences with, with uh, education. We've not succeeded with privatization of education, whereas, whereas the private sector per se continues to, continues to put its faith in privatization of healthcare or uh, education and you know, in, in similar domains, right, where uh, which, which may not necessarily meeting the, the overall good of the country. I mean, we, we, we're not getting anywhere, but the debate, these debates haven't been resolved, right? And we don't even have a clear government position on this. Uh, in such a situation, for money to flow out in ways and be invested in ways which have, which benefit the larger number of, largest number of people, um, uh, would you say that the, you know, the chances of, of money being used in ways that don't actually get to the, the true beneficiaries? Those dangers exist in, in, in situations like India where regulations are weak, enforcement is weaker, definitions themselves are weak. Now, I would start off, if I were to be the government, I would define public goods first. And to me, health and education are very primary level public goods. And, and you, they, you, even permitting privatization of public good, I would go with a lot of thinking. Let's look at how is, how is the UK, a fairly well-developed country, fairly responsible citizenry. Though it's a huge expenditure on NHS, very cr heavily criticized. The government is criticized the amount of money it spends on national health services. Maybe they can be more efficient. But end of the day, they are delivering good health care to the citizens. It's a public good. There's also a private sector. Now, I may not even opt to go to the private sector, but I might say I can't wait six months for the surgery. I'll go to the private sector. It's a call I take. But then the public sector is available and gives a high quality care. Look at the Canadian system. Canadian system also is fairly high taxation countries these are, but they deliver services, the Scandinavian countries. So to me, the private sector thrives only because the public sector is inefficient. Yeah. If a public school is very good, why would a child want to go to a private school? Because we think public sector can be mediocre. It's only for the poor. It's only for the undeserving. We don't see it as a public good for every citizen. Now look at Sri Lanka's education system. It's completely, mostly public. Right. And it's why is it doing well? Because the state invests. So to me, to build the economy, I'm talking, states have to build the human capital of people. And that's a public responsibility. That's the obligation so, of the state. So, and so, so the, 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 the point that I'm trying to, what, what, the point I'm trying to place before you is that do we need a much more bigger, a much bigger debate in the country on these fundamentals? Because today it is the private sector which dr drives the public debates in this country, right? <laughs> so, the, and, and it not only drives them, it decides them because, uh, you know, whether it's advertising in publications or advertising on TV stations, you know, or, uh, or deciding what, uh, what governments have to say, right? The private sector has a disproportionate impact. Um, now, when, when we are looking at market mechanisms for money, Right. Obviously, this is in a much larger framework and you know, it's not just within the tight framework of, of the stock exchange. Look at the market mechanisms for money. Uh, aren't we jumping the gun? I, you know, we, are, we are going much ahead of what we are. We're not a Canada. Canada sorted these things out much earlier. We're not a Britain. Britain sorted these things out much earlier. We're not even a United States, you know, which still struggles with many things, but has sorted many, many things out. We have no sense of fraternity in the country. We might have, you know, equality, but no, no sense of fraternity. In such a situation, how does it work? You know, should, should we be debating all this before we are debating a stock exchange? No, I, I absolutely agree with you. And that's my fear. My, my, my reason to jump into this narrative and the discussion was the announcement was made. Now, I see a budget document as a policy document of the state. Once the budget is approved by parliament, that is the law of the country. So when the stock exchange has been announced, whether you and I like it or not, the government is going to set it up. And uh, something which has been set up in a hurry without all this kind of thinking and discussion will possibly fail. And then my fear is five years down the line, 10 years down the line, any government in power will say, we tried that experiment, it did not work. 
and we lose out an opportunity of trying to find private resources for public good. So my fear and the reason why I joined into the conversation was now that we announced it, at least can we wait to work all these things through? Spend the next three to five years in thinking through, putting the systems in place, putting all these discussions in clear, clarified, defining all these terms, including public good, etc. Define the responsibility of the state. I'll give a small example why I'm, why I'm really anxious and nervous. SEBI sets up a working group. Most of the members are from the finance sector. There's no social sector representative there at all. Yeah. There's nobody even to say what the hell is social sector. The government is the primary stakeholder. The Ministry of Corporate Affairs, they just casually write a statement. We invited MCA for the meeting. They did not turn up. Now, that is not the way you look at a report. You Something so primary and such a paradigmatic shifting the country, you cannot but go ahead without the government's blessing. The Ministry of Corporate Affairs had to be an invested stakeholder in these narratives. So my fear is we're going to end up with something which is going to be only promoting private interests. And those fears are real. I'm not even exaggerating them. Whether you and I like it or not, whether we can shift the narrative or not, elite capture is a reality in most countries. I'm not just saying India. Every major country, there's an elite capture. I'm worried that the social stock exchange is also going to an elite capture. And then we lose the entire narrative of social sector development itself. So Those are real fears money, of mine. More money, may, money moves away from good causes. Yeah. So uh, those are not unfounded fears. We need the debate. So I've been, I've been, I, you know, I have, I have commented to SEBI. I've sent them my reports, and I've said that please keep this debate going. You can't give a week's time and say comment, and we'll just in, uh, look at the comments. Six months of national debate should happen. Let's talk about it. These kind of conversations should be there at every level, and then thinking through what needs to be done as a precursor. Draw out a roadmap. Have clarity on what you do when lead towards a social stock exchange, maybe three, five, ten years down the line. It doesn't matter that that can emerge later, but let a lot of background work first get settled because social sector development is too important to be left in the hands of just the private sector. Okay. So the whole social enterprise idea, as well as the funding of social enterprises, using market mechanisms, using private funding, it, it's not new. It's been happening globally, but the idea of a social stock exchange in India, in India, in its current form, where has it come from? Honestly, I have no evidential basis for this. I can only make a guess. Somebody must have read about it somewhere or UN must have put some pressure saying, you know, 2009-10, we said you should all move in towards this, uh, these mechanisms. Somebody must have put up a note to the powers that be and then it got announced. But my belief is that, you know, when the United Nations announced their social stock exchange initiative, they looked at existing stock exchanges evolving or setting up cells within themselves to look at sustainability. Like the Bombay Stock Exchange has got a sustainable stock initiative cell. I've spoken to the MD of the Bombay Stock Exchange. He said, we already have something here. Why are we even setting up a new one? Then we have National Stock Exchange as something like this. So there's a lot of mechanisms for ESGs. There's a lot of specific focus on MSMEs. So a lot of preliminary work is being done. I think whoever decided to Look, at, look into this, has not seen all the work that's also happening in India, seeing the lessons uh, that we can learn from them and then integrating them and asking, do we even need a social stock exchange? I, for one, strongly believe, it's my conviction that we need private sector investment for social development. But I need it to be regulated. I need it to be transparent. I need it to be ensured that the primacy of social sector doesn't disappear. I am for a social stock exchange. Let me clarify that. But it is premature is what is my concern. We have not got our act together. Let's not blame the exchange after it failed, saying that the exchange failed. Maybe we need to blame ourselves because the ecosystem has not been created. We have to invest on the ecosystem. That is hard work. That's a decade long work, in my opinion. And in India, it's going to be much longer because a lot of things have to change. We have to understand that all the fears that you said, there is private capture, there is elite capture, there are a lot of narratives which are misdirected. There are a lot of foreign interests. We have not thought about it. The SEBI report talks about international investors coming into India. They are the largest inverters. The, the impact investors in India are a handful, six or seven, you can count. 74 to 84% of the investors are from outside. What happened? They're asking for an FCRA law to be amended. We are willing to look at an NGO, which is called FCRA recognition with suspicion, but we somehow think that we want to legitimize a social enterprise that's going to be uh, looking at international impact investment as okay for us. That somehow all these contradictions are there. We, if we don't resolve all that and jump into the exchange proper right away, I feel it might be a premature mistake, which will cost a wonderful process to be lost because of a prematureness. So a great opportunity would go waste. 
that's my fear. That's my fear. Yeah. And okay, so now the final question. You know, there's little doubt that uh, we have this large number of NGOs, and interestingly, from your report, I find that a, a great many of them are actually private limited companies. Now, uh, that this is very, it's, it's a revelation to me, certainly. Um, but we have this large number of NGOs, and they are all working in the social sector in some form or the other, many doing excellent work. Uh, it's inherent in, in, in an organization which is setting out to do good that their processes may not be that great, right? And uh, uh, their methods may not be, uh, you know, sufficiently transparent. It's not necessarily that there's wrongdoing. Uh, it's in the hurly-burly of what they do. So there is a need to structure up better. Right. And uh, the, would they be able to uh, seize the opportunities, given their current uh, status, uh, would they be able to seize the opportunities that such uh, as an exchange would offer? Because it would seem to me that they can't. As proposed today, absolutely no. I'll, I'll even answer more personally. Will I be able to step up? No. We are a reasonably large NGO, maybe one of the largest in the state of Karnataka. I will not be able to absorb the financial instruments that are being proposed today. I can't even figure them out. So I worry on one side, if you remember the CBI report to the court said that we are on 31 or 32 lakh NGOs, right? The SEBI looks at only organizations which are in the domain of the, what they're calling information repositories. And they're even to call, name them. They're naming GuideStar, they're naming Credibility Alliance and they're naming Darpan. Now Darpan as of last month has only got 93,000 NGOs registered. It's a government of India portal. And if you're going to take that as information repository of India, 32 lakh NGOs already left out. So my fear is NGOs don't even have the ability to register themselves on Darpan, but they're doing a lot of good work. If you're measuring their good work, that's a different measurement. If you're measuring their ability to brand themselves, write nice reports, make flashy presentations, write out these great things to the corporate world and get the measurements done, give quarterly, quarterly reports, maybe many of them don't. Many of them may not even be meet up to the standards. They need to build up their capacity. They need to build up their capacity of programs, processes, governance. I'm not even disputing all that. Let's use this opportunity to incrementally strengthen and build that sector. Let's not bring in a mechanism of demand, which is so high that it will extinguish the sector. If you say only the information repository is responsible, only 93,000 NGOs have option to get into the space. You are essentially saying 32 lakh hell, die, die by the wayside. I don't care. I don't think it's fair. I think we need a capacity building process. That is the ecosystem I'm talking about. Build capacities, keep their sources of funding available. Philanthropy is not going to die. Just because you're creating an investor option doesn't mean I want to invest. I may want to still give donations. So we need these organizations which are fulfilling a critical role. No, very few people talk about it. Look at the migrant crisis, what emerged after the lockdown period. Eliminate NGOs from India. I will tell you that crisis would have been disastrous. They stood up to the cost. They delivered. We yeah. cannot deny that. They are, let's also look at this. NGOs are one of the larger employers in this country. Just because we're not formally declaring how many people we employ, we don't look at it. Everybody gets support. MSME gets support. Everybody gets support because they're all seen as wealth creators. But we are also wealth creators because you don't monetize the social wealth that we're creating. You think we are not creators. Huge amount of people are getting laid off in the NGO sector. 30 to 40 percent of NGOs, as we know them, will disappear next year because the entire financial spectrum is going to change. So I believe that let's look at options of strengthening that sector because civil society is a very mature representation of democracy. It is not a threat to democracy. We have to see them as integral to our growth and evolution. And to me, we need to build mechanisms of state support. And I see social stock exchange as a neutral regulatory empire for one set of civil society organizations, which have the capacity to understand the financial instruments, which have the capacity to deliver to the transparency demands, to the measurement demands, and to the investor, build investor confidence, that small bandwidth of organizations can be a growing band over time. But we cannot eliminate the existing band just to create this small band for those people. So my thing of creating the ecosystem is allow existing systems to continue to flourish till they may die a natural death someday. You continue to build a new vehicle, a new system, a new platform, which may continue to do a lot of good work in the future. Or allow an organic evolution. Don't force fit something to fit into an imitated model that you bring from abroad. Let's get an indigenous social stock exchange, which is culturally acceptable, which is contextually relevant. Let's not forget India has got its own strengths. You know, let's not think the only outside world can teach us how to do it. 
can we learn from them i'm not saying we shouldn't learn i'm a fan of learning from everybody but let's not forget our dna our strengths our abilities what we have achieved till date see if we can actually evolve that into something more better we could become the role model i am telling you as a person who's done a lot of work in of research in this space there is no successful social stock exchange in the world let's accept it maybe the opportunity for india to really be the jagat guru that we want to be in every sense we're talking about it maybe let's set a model of social development which can find private avenues maybe we'll be the one to crack the code of actually looking at private gains along with public good one cannot be at the cost of the other it has to go hand in hand the society can't move forward i i'm i'm an eternal romantic but at the same time i'm also pragmatic i believe that we need to move hand in hand we need a very benevolent regulatory government which understand that regulation means transparency and not suffocation we need a civil society which also is able to expand its bandwidth in terms of finance in terms of talent in terms of good that it's doing we need a corporate sector which also is socially responsible maybe the dna of all the four can flow into the fourth sector where we create a new vehicle called a social enterprise i am calling it an indian social enterprise in my report with a dna which is very particular to india and i am very confident if it's handled properly it's a gold mine that we are sitting on but if you don't handle it properly it's something like throwing down a box of dynamite into the gold mine and you're going to shut the mine forever so those are the fears i have and i so might much. sound a little dramatic but these are real fears of mine thank you so much and it's a lovely meeting you again balu and it's a pleasure always to be uh, either writing for or talking to civil society because i believe you play a critical role in creating these narratives in priming the audience to understand that we all need to ask the difficult questions